As the courses advanced, the conversation grew bustling and more personal. Pulex and Cyril and Mariska and Catalan opened a fire of raillery. The infidelities of Cerise, the difficulties of Brancas, Sarmian's caprices that morning in the lily garden, Torillier's declining strength, Astarte's affection for Rosiola, Felix's impossible member, Catalan's passion for Sulpilia's poodle, Sola's passion for herself, the nasty bite that Mariska gave Chloe, the epilatier of Pulex, Cyril's diseases, Butor's illness, Merrick's tiny cemetery, Lesbia's profound fourth letter, and a thousand amatory follies of the day were discussed. From harsh and shrill and clamant, the voices grew blurred and inarticulate. Bad sentences were helped out by worse gestures, and at one table, Scabius expressed himself like the famous old knight in the first part of the soldier's fortune of Otway. Basilisa and Lysistrata tried to pronounce each other's names and became very affectionate in the attempt. Antala, the tragedian, robed in roomy purple and wearing plume and buskin, rose to his feet and with swaying gestures began to recite one of his favorite parts. He got no further than the first line, but repeated it again and again with fresh accents and intonations each time, and was only silenced by the approach of the asparagus that was being served by satyrs dressed in white. Clitor and Sodon had a violent struggle over the beautiful Pella and nearly upset a chandelier. Sophie became very intimate with an empty champagne bottle, swore it had made her enceinte, and ended by having a mock accouchement on the top of the table. And Bellamore pretended to be a dog, and pranced from couch to couch on all fours, biting and barking and licking. Melfont crept about dropping love filters into glasses. Juventus and Ruella stripped and put on each other's things. Spelto offered a prize for whoever should come first, and Spelto won it. Tannhäuser, just a little grisé, lay down on the cushions and let Julia do whatever she liked. I wish I could be allowed to tell you what occurred round table 15 just at this moment. It would amuse you very much and would give you a capital idea of the habits of Venus retinue. Indeed, for deplorable reasons, by far the greater part of what was said and done at this supper must remain unrecorded and even unsuggested. Venus allowed most of the dishes to pass untasted, as she was so engaged with the beauty of Tannhäuser. She laid her head many times on his robe, kissing him passionately, and his skin at once, firm and yielding, seemed to those exquisite little teeth of hers the most incomparable pasture. Her upper lip curled and trembled with excitement, showing the gums. Tannhäuser, on his side, was no less devoted, he adored her all over, and all the things she had on, and buried his face in the folds and flounces of her linen, and ravished away a score of frills in his excess. He found her exasperating, and crushed her in his arms, and slaked his parched lips at her mouth. He caressed her eyelids softly with his fingertips, and pushed aside the curls from her forehead, and did a thousand gracious things, tuning her body as a violinist tunes his instrument before playing upon it. Mrs. Marsupel snorted like an old war horse at the sniff of powder, and tickled Tannhäuser and Venus by turns, and slipped her tongue down their throats, and refused to be quiet at all until she had had a mouthful of the Chevalier. Claude, seizing his chance, dived under the table and came up on the other side just under Venus' couch, and before she could say, one, he was taking his coffee, au du cologne. Claire was furious at his friend's success and sulked for the rest of the evening. 